Good evening, everyone. Welcome tonight to Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship, and we are very pleased to have Creation Ministries International come and put on some presentations for us. I want to just give you a couple of quick announcements just real quickly. If you're wondering why this wooden box is here, this is a And for, for the work, but I know that they go through a lot of costs shipping that material down here and flights and things and hotel rooms. And so they do not charge for this, and so there is no charge for this event tonight. But if you would like to uh, just say thank you to Creation Ministries for coming, then this donation box is going to be on the table in the back. And what you can do is just, if you have, would like to give some money, then just put it in the box. Anything that goes into the box will go directly to Creation Ministries and that will be on the table as soon as you go back out the door. We also want to let you know that my wife and a few of the ladies from the church are putting on a children's program upstairs in the children's ministry room, and that's for any children up to grade five, up to grade five. So if you would like your children to go upstairs to the children's ministry up to grade five, uh, th that will be going on upstairs for those who would like to avail themselves of it. Uh, again, we are so thankful that you've taken the time on this beautiful day to come and to see what our, the Word of God has to say about science. And, and uh, by the way, they don't contradict one another. The Bible is very scientific, and the science does back up the Scripture, and we're so thankful for Creation Ministries for that. Thomas Bailey, would you come and be, begin our program? But while you're coming, let's just pause for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we do look to you, and Lord, we need your help tonight, and we pray by thy Spirit that you'd work and move in our hearts and our lives tonight and change us, convince us of these truths, we pray, and help us, Lord, to be better equipped to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to show the, to the world the Bible is true, and it knows what it's talking about. And so, Father, increase our strength and give us confidence and bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, good evening. Uh, just one quick note before we get going uh, in talking about donations. Um, you can also make donations to CMI at the uh, sales table if you want to use debit or a credit card. Um, we can take them there as well. My name's Thomas Bailey, and I come from Exeter, Ontario. Who knows where that is? Just a couple of you. Uh, do you know where London, Ontario is, southern Ontario? It's in that little triangle piece of Ontario, and um, it's a town about the same size as Sussex. It's a little bit north of London. My wife and I have been married for 32 years. We have two adult, grandch or adult children, I should say, who are married as well, and two grandchildren. But I'm here tonight as part of Creation Ministries International. And one of the interesting things about our ministry is that we not only partner with a global community of Bible-believing scientists, we also employ quite a few PhD scientists ourselves. I'm not one of them. Okay, I'm a regular guy. Now, my job is to communicate their research in a way that regular people can understand it. But there's lots of technical information available if you want it. As a ministry, we have two goals. We want to encourage you in your faith and let you know it's okay to believe the Bible from the very first verse, just the way it's written. There's lots of scientific evidence that backs up what the Bible says about history. Now, we're not looking to science to prove the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God, so that's our authority. But we do find that science supports what the Bible says very, very well. We also want to give you information to help you in your witnessing. I'm sure we all know people who are skeptical of the Bible's claims because of something they heard in science class or in the media, something to do with millions of years or evolution and things like that, things they think contradict what the Bible says. So we want to give you some information to have an intelligent conversation with the skeptics you know and get them hopefully a little closer to understanding that the Bible really can be trusted. And if the Bible can be trusted when it talks about origins, it can also be trusted when it talks about salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's the ultimate goal, right? It's not about winning an argument here. What we really want to do is help people get closer to believing the Bible and ultimately, hopefully, putting their faith in Jesus. So we are an information ministry, which means, of course, we have a website. And our website is fairly easy to remember. It's called creation.com. Say it with me, creation.com. There will be a test later. Great place to go if you have any questions that have to do with Genesis. Could be Creation Week, Noah's Flood, dinosaurs, fossils, all kinds of scientific matters that come into play when we're talking about the Bible. 
Now, there's thousands, of, over 15,000 articles on that website, and there's hundreds of videos as well, including every episode of our TV show, Creation Magazine Live. This is a half-hour show that we uh, produce right in our Kitchener office, and uh, we're in our ninth season now. Oh, and incidentally, those two guys, we do everything now on a green screen, a CGI set. So what that means is that in the picture there, the two guys are the only things that are real. All right? They are real people, honest. All right. A few years ago, a friend of mine told me a story about his niece. Now, she was about five or six years old at the time, and she had heard the creation account from the Bible. How God created the heavens and the earth in six days, on the seventh day he rested. Now, after hearing this, this little girl apparently said, How do you know? Who was there? I said, Those are valid questions. Now, that may surprise you to hear me say this, but let's think about this logically for a moment. Let's do a quick review of the creation account from Genesis 1. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. He separated the light from the darkness. There was evening, there was morning, one day. On day two, God created an expanse around the earth. And then on day three, he separated land from water and created vegetation. On day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. On day five, he created birds and sea creatures. And then on day six, all of the land animals, as well as man in his own image, both male and female. On the seventh day, he rested. So you can see the little girl's logic. She'll be thinking, well, I wasn't around way back then. And there were no people until day six. So how do you know who was there? I said, those are valid questions. But I hope she uses the same logic when she goes to school and they tell her about the Big Bang and evolution. You've probably heard this idea before as well. How something like 13.8 billion years ago there was nothing and then suddenly a very tiny something which exploded. And then about 4.6 billion years ago planets including the earth began to form. And then after about another billion years there were lifeless chemicals on the earth from those lifeless chemicals came the first tiny living organism, life from no life. And then over the course of millions and billions of years, that tiny organism gradually evolved and became more complex, and we ended up getting things like uh, birds and reptiles and so on, and eventually modern man evolved. All of this over billions of years. So I said, I hope she uses the same logic and asks, how do you know who was there? Because, you see, if we compare these two histories, we'll find that for creation, we've only got five or six days to account for before there were people around to tell about it. For the evolution story, or the naturalist story, well, there's billions of years of what they would call prehistory with nobody around. Now, of course, that's not the only difference between these two histories, is it? I mean, how do we know the creation account to start with? We read it. Right? It's in the Bible. It's in the Word of God. And speaking of God, there He is in the very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So that answers one of the questions right there. Who was there? God was there. Before there was man or an earth or time itself, there was God. And God inspired Moses and other eyewitnesses to write down the Word of God. And of course, God Himself is an eyewitness to His own creation. He made sure this got written down in a way we can read it and understand it even today. So if we compare those two histories again, we find that for creation we have a written record. We have eyewitness testimony, and behind it all is God. Now for the evolution story or the naturalist story, well, there's no written record. There's no eyewitnesses for billions of years and no God. Or at least, no God required. Because you see, this whole idea is put forward to, to try to answer the question, what if there's no God? If there's no God who created the heavens and the earth, then it must have created itself somehow, and that must have taken billions of years. So what we end up with here is two very different histories coming from different starting assumptions. Now somebody could be thinking, well, hasn't science proven that the earth is billions of years old? Let's consider some key things about science. 
First of all, evolution is not synonymous with science. It's not like it's, uh, there's an equal sign between the word evolution and the word science. It isn't evolution and science over here versus creation and faith over here. Creation and science have always gone hand in hand. However, sometimes science gets confused with history. And finally, the facts don't speak for themselves. So when we talk about science, you can think about what you learned in school. We make observations, we form a hypothesis of what we think will happen under certain circumstances, and we run experiments to test our hypothesis. It's observable, it's repeatable, it's testable. But sometimes science gets confused with history. Maybe you've heard terms like historical science or forensic science. These are terms we use when we want to use science to figure out what happened in the past. Now, of course, a great way to know what happened in the past would be to have an eyewitness. Maybe they wrote it down. If we don't have an eyewitness, the best we can do is look at the evidence in the present and try to figure it out from that. But science is limited here. Science is meant for making observations in the present. You can't really run an experiment on something that already happened in the past. And the farther back you go, the harder it gets. And unfortunately, the facts don't speak for themselves. Let me give you an example. Suppose we find a dinosaur fossil. Now, there are certain things that we can study and find out about it by looking at its composition, where did we find it, how much is it decayed, and those would be in the realm of observable facts. That would be science, right? But that fossil doesn't come with a tag attached to it that says, hi, my name is Parasaurolophus. You can call me Para for short. And uh, I like walks on the beach, and I was born April 15th, 75 million years ago. Right? It doesn't come with that much information. And yet, if you read a, an article about a fossil find, you'll probably read something there about how long ago they think it, it showed up. Usually something in the millions of years. Things they didn't observe. Now, because the facts don't speak for themselves to that extent, we have to make an interpretation on the evidence we find. And our interpretations are always based on a set of presuppositions. It's a framework of ideas or, or biases, if you will, that we already hold to be true. Uh, for, and everybody does this. I mean, there's really no such thing as a completely unbiased scientist. A biblical creationist, for example, would say, well, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Bible is real history, and we base our interpretations within that framework. A naturalist, on the other hand, the evolutionist perhaps, might say, well, the Bible's irrelevant. There is no God. The universe created itself over billions of years, and one thing evolved into another, and so on. And so then what we end up with is two very different interpretations, coming from two different sets of presuppositions or worldviews, but it's the same evidence. So when we go back to our fossil here, there's certain things we can learn about by studying the fossil in the here and now. They call that operational science. But as soon as we start talking about how it got there and when and, and things that we did not observe, well, that's in the realm of interpretation based on our worldview, and that's in the realm of the history that we ascribe to it. Now, one of the problems we run into is often the interpretation gets put out there as if it's proven fact. We see this all the time. We see it in science journals, school curriculum, the media. Of course, we're going to find it on websites. Now, I don't have anything against this particular website, but here's an example of what I'm talking about. You can visit this website. It's all about a museum, and they have this fossil exhibit there. And on this page, it mentions 700 fossil specimens on display. There's one up in the top corner. It's a T-Rex chomping down on a triceratops. Now, see, those would be the facts. Those would be the actual observable evidence that's been studied. That's the science. But you'll notice in the title, they've already equated fossils with deep time. Well, that's the interpretation. <laughs> that's an interpretation based on a presupposition that the universe created itself over billions of years. One thing evolved into another and so on. And we go down through the text and we find other phrases like ancient ecosystems, long ago geological events. Here's my favorite one. It says, learn how to interpret the scientific evidence. 
Well, that sounds pretty good. Sounds like I can go there and I can look at the evidence and I can interpret it for myself. I think we get the idea from reading this that what they really want you to do is accept their interpretation as the only valid one. And they're putting it forward here not as an interpretation, but as if it's proven fact. Now that's something we could call indoctrination. I'm sure we all want our children and our grandchildren to be critical thinkers, right? To ask questions, look at different sides of an argument. But it's hard to be a critical thinker when you're only ever given the same interpretation year after year after year from the time you're a little kid reading a dinosaur book all the way to university. And maybe you never get a chance to look at another idea, another perspective. See, it's not hard to find this kind of an interpretation of the evidence everywhere we go. It's a lot harder to get an interpretation of the same evidence from a biblical perspective. And that's why ministries like ours exist. It's why we have a website. It's why we have all those scientists. why we send speakers into churches. It's why we have uh, information like our, our email newsletter called InfoBytes. This is an email that we send out from time to time that highlights a few key articles from our website from time to time. And it's a way of getting a little bit of our information to you by email that doesn't cost anything. Now we have other ways to connect with us online as well. Uh, maybe you already get our emails. You can also connect with us on Facebook, on Instagram, YouTube, and other social media. I'm going to ask the ushers if you would grab those uh, clipboards at this time. If you would like to connect with our ministry, either by email or by social media in some way, then as the clipboards come around, what you can do is take one of these blue pieces of paper off from there. They're perforated, so you'll have to take the slip off from the clipboard. Give us your name and your email address, and then check off the number of ways that you would like to connect. As I said, if you already get our emails, you can connect another way as well. And then bring that to us at the table at one of the breaks out in the foyer, and if you decide you want to buy something tonight and you fill out one of these forms, then we'll give you a free sleeve DVD along with that. Or maybe you don't want to buy anything, you just want to sign up, that's great. But either way, you need to bring the form back to the table at one of the breaks later on. I'm going to ask that we just go ahead and pass those back and forth as we continue through the talk. Now, somebody could be thinking, you know, we're talking a lot about Genesis here tonight. I heard Genesis was a side issue. You know, it's not real history, and it's not about uh, science, and it's not as important as other major doctrines like the gospel, for example. Well, let's see how important Genesis is. Let's take a look at Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, that's the gospel message right there. The wages of sin is death. Because there's sin, there's death. Sin separates us from God. That's the bad news. The good news is, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who lived a sinless life and then died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and reconcile us to God and then rose from the dead, we can have eternal life. That's the great news of the gospel we have to share with the world. But it all hinges on the notion that the wages of sin is death. So where do we get that idea? Take a look at Genesis 2. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. See, God had created plants to be food for not just animals but people as well. As of the end of day 6, nobody was eating meat. No bloodshed, no carnivory. Specifically, God tells Adam, you can eat from any tree in the garden, but if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. The implication being there was no death in the world up until that point. Of course, there was no sin up until that point. And you may remember how it went. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They disobeyed God. They sinned. And that brought the curse of death into the world. Everything now dies because of that curse, because of sin. They receive both physical and spiritual death, which we inherit from them, and that's why we need a Savior. So when you think about it, there's got to be something historical about Genesis here in order for the gospel to fully make sense. Even atheists understand this. A fellow named Richard Bozarth a few years ago said, 
Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. So here's an atheist saying, look it, if there was not a literal Adam and Eve, then you don't have a literal sin, and therefore you don't have any need of a Savior, and the gospel just falls apart. And this is what evolution means, and he believes evolution. See, when you think about it, we know that Jesus lived and was crucified and rose again in actual history. Those things really happened. But you know, there was not a literal Adam who literally sinned and brought literal death into the world. Then why would we need a literal Savior to die a literal death on a literal cross and literally rise from the dead to save us from our sins? You see, Genesis needs to be real history to make the most sense out of the gospel. And how about marriage? Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. Now he's talking here to people who want to allow divorce for different reasons. Right? But, but he's saying, no, no. God's idea from the beginning was one man, one woman, one flesh for life. And to back up his argument here, he's actually quoting from both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Some folks think those chapters contradict each other, but they don't. You see, Jesus understood Genesis to be real history. Do we believe Jesus? Now, somebody could be thinking, okay, look, you know, we hear so much about evolution. You know, maybe they go together somehow. Maybe we could take the two ideas and mash them together. Maybe God even used evolution some way. And a number of well-meaning theologians have tried to find ways to do that. Well, let's see how well that works. I want to start with what the Bible says about those six days of creation. On the seventh day, God rested. And then let's see if we can add in the evolution idea as represented by those many layers of rock that are full of fossils. Layers, we're told, represent millions of years of slow and gradual evolution. Of course, that would mean millions of years of death and, and decay and, and bloodshed and disease, right? Because those fossils represent creatures that actually lived and died. There's bloodshed in the fossil record. There's even cancer in the fossil record. So we have to take that into account if we want to roll those millions of years of evolution into the Bible somewhere. Let's see if we can fit him in before creation week, before day one. Well, let's not forget the first verse. In the beginning, God created. Now, if God used millions of years of evolution to create before that, then does that mean there were two beginnings? Did God start over and he didn't tell us about it? And how do we account for all of that death before sin? Because remember, death came into the world as a result of sin. There was no sin until there was an Adam. There was no Adam until day six. If God used millions of years of evolution to create before that, that means millions of years of death going on before sin, meaning death is then not the result of sin. And if death isn't the result of sin, then why do we need a Savior? This idea undermines the gospel message. In Genesis 1.31 says, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. I don't know if you've ever pictured the Garden of Eden. You know, with Adam and Eve there, everything's very beautiful, all the animals are there, and, and God has called His creation very good. But you know, if He used millions of years of evolution to get that far, well, that means they're already standing on a bone pile that's a mile deep. And there you got all that death and suffering, disease, you got thorns. <laughs> kind of calls into question the character of a God that would call that very good. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul reminds us the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. All through Scripture, we're led to believe that death is a bad thing. It's an intruder. needs to be defeated. Jesus came to defeat death, amongst other things. So then why would God use millions of years of death in order to create? It just doesn't seem to fit. So if the millions of years of evolution don't fit before creation week, maybe we can put them in during creation week. What if the days are not literal days? Maybe each one is a, a long period of time, like a, a billion years. Now, Hebrew scholars from around the world, people who don't even believe the Bible, 
have affirmed that the word yom in Hebrew for day, in the context we find it in, in Genesis 1, with a set of numbers and phrases like evening and morning, in that context, it always means a literal day. And then we have Exodus 20, 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here's an explanation of our week. Ever wonder why a week is seven days, not ten? Why is it we're supposed to work six days and rest on the seventh? Because that's what God did. Now, he wasn't tired. This is Almighty God. He could have done it all in an instant, and He could have done it in billions of years. But He chose to do it in six earth rotation days, and He set that as a pattern for us. So if you think about it, if each one of those days was really a billion years long, well, who's looking forward to Monday? <laughs> Only five billion years of the weekend. Now, if God wanted to create in billions of years, He could have done that, and He would have told us that's what He did. Instead, He made it very clear and wrote it here in the Ten Commandments. And, of course, in this model, we still have the problem of death before sin. So, really, the only place the fossils can fit in biblical history, because they represent death, would be sometime after sin comes along, which means after creation week. But can they be millions of years old? In Genesis 5 and 11, we find what are called chronogenealogies. They're not just lists of names that say Adam begat Seth and so on. But there's a measured number of years between Adam and his son and, and from, him, from his son to his son and so on. And we can follow that chronology and do the math from Adam all the way to Abraham. And we, that adds up to approximately 2,000 years. And then, of course, we look at other biblical history and other sources. And we find that Abraham was born probably around 2,000 B.C. So that all gives us a total world history then, according to the Bible of only about 6,000 years. Maybe a little bit longer, but certainly not millions. And so, if the millions of years of evolution don't fit in what the Bible says, then, well, maybe we should alter our hypothesis of mashing the ideas together, and instead, let's ask the question, are those fossils and layers of rock really millions of years old? I mean, how long does it take for a fossil to form, for example? In the past, we've been taught that it's a slow process. It could take millions of years. But then we find things like this. Here's a couple of fish caught in the middle of lunch. You got one fish eating the other fish, and they're fossilized like that. Do you suppose they stayed in that position for millions of years while they got gradually covered in sediment? <laughs> Something happened to bury these fish rapidly. Because you see, paleontologists are admitting more and more that fossilization requires rapid burial. If a living thing dies and isn't buried rapidly, then it's going to decay, it gets picked apart by predators, and you've got nothing left to be a fossil. So that's a lot of rapid burial in that whole fossil record. Here's my favorite example of this. This is a well-preserved ichthyosaur. But if we look closely, there's two ichthyosaurs here. That's baby ichthy being born. Yeah, this is a mama giving birth, and they're fossilized in that position. Do you suppose that took millions of years? Yeah, ladies are all thinking, no. <laughs> Something happened to bury them rapidly. And there's other evidence in the fossil record, too, that they're not millions of years old. There's now been, over the last 30 years, dozens of discoveries of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. Things like blood cells, blood vessels, bits of collagen, proteins, DNA, highly unstable things that everybody knows from science, they don't last close, anywhere close to millions of years. This example comes from 2005. A lady named Mary Schweitzer found a T-Rex bone that she thought was almost 70 million years old. Inside, she found actual blood vessels that were soft and stretchy. She could pull them apart, they snapped back like an elastic. Powerful evidence that these things are not as old as we've been taught. Here's a great example of some soft tissue. This is a notosaur that was found in Fort McMurray a few years ago. Now, what's interesting about this guy is it's not just bones like most fossils. 
There's actual flesh and, and skin and even pigment in the skin. Very rare in a fossil find. Very well preserved. Researchers have looked at this and they say that it's probably 18 feet long. Probably was buried in running water upside down. Take a look at that picture on the bottom right hand side. Those speckles there. Researchers believe that's the remnants of this creature's last meal. And yet, they want us to believe that this thing is 110 million years old. Actually, since then, they've discovered that those remnants uh, are made up of plants that, as far as evolutionists are concerned, didn't even, weren't even involved yet when this thing was alive. Let's go back to the rapid burial idea. If you go to Joggins Bay over in Nova Scotia, you can look at cliff faces there. You can see all kinds of layers of rock with fossils showing in those layers. And you can see something like this. An upright tree trunk completely fossilized through many layers of rock. Layers, what we're told, took millions of years to form. Now, I've had dead trees taken down in my backyard. They didn't show any signs of staying upright for millions of years. Well, they got gradually covered in sediment. Something happened to bury this thing rapidly. But then that means those layers of rock had to form rapidly. Is that even possible? Well, here's another cliff in Washington State. It's part of a canyon. It's about 130 feet high at this point, that wall. Now, I'm old enough to remember when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980. I'm, I was 13 at the time. You can do the math if you want. <laughs> what I found out later is three distinct events happened there, each on a single day. And each of those single-day events caused the formation of one of those major bands of rock you see there. The first two eruptions happened about a month apart, and they caused those first two layers. And then mud flows came down from the mountain almost two years later, and we get that third layer. Now, in the middle layer, we find uh, a lot of the fine layering that's known as laminae. Normally, we observe one or two of these layers gets laid down in the course of a year. So you'd add that up. You'd get millions of years. But in this case, there's 25 feet thick of those fine layers that were laid down in only the course of about three hours. Clearly, layers of rock can form quickly. And flume testing has borne this out. Experiments have been done where if you take a bunch of different types of jumbled up sediment all ground up and run it in fast flowing water, what will happen is the grains will sort themselves by size and weight and you'll get multiple different types of sediment in layers forming simultaneously from one side to the other. Not one on top of the other like we've been taught. So all you need is a bunch of sediment and a bunch of fast flowing water. And then there's the canyon itself. Now there's a river flowing down through the middle of this canyon. And if we didn't know any better, we might assume that the river carved the canyon over millions of years. That's what we've been taught. But in this case, when those mud flows came down from the mountain, they carved out the canyon also in a single day. The river came later because of rainfall. So that means that the river didn't cause the canyon, the canyon caused the river. What a difference it makes when we have eyewitness testimony, we get a different interpretation on the same evidence. So where do we get the idea that layers of rock always form slowly and gradually? It's an idea called uniformitarianism. A couple hundred years ago, some geologists suggested the present is the key to the past. So if we see slow and gradual sedimentation happening in the present, and we do, the assumption was that it's always been like that in the distant past and it's never changed. The problem with this logic is it doesn't take into account the possibility of some catastrophe that may have happened in the past. You know, something like Mount St. Helens, for example. Or how about a global flood, like the one we read about in Genesis? Now, some say it was a local flood, it got exaggerated over time, but what does the Bible tell us about it? In Genesis 7, 7, we read, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Now a cubit is the distance between a man's elbow and the tip of his fingers, about 18 inches. So this is telling us that all the mountains under the sky were covered in water to a depth of more than 20 feet. That doesn't sound like a local flood to me. What's described in those chapters is global in proportions. And can you imagine the devastation from that? 
From that amount of water, the amount of sediment being churned up and then laid down again quickly, the number of things buried in the sediment. Jesus refers to it here in Luke 17. He says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, he's talking about his second coming, a judgment still to come. But he's saying, you know what, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. Because Jesus understood Genesis to be real history. So did Peter. Second Peter 3, he said, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Now, in the next verse, he too draws a parallel between that watery judgment of the past and a future judgment to come. And he's telling us here that a time's going to come along when people will deny that a global flood ever happened despite all the evidence. Because you see, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people looked at those layers of rock full of fossils and understood that as evidence for Noah's flood. Made perfect sense. It wasn't until those geologists came along with a different interpretation of those layers that people, that theologians started trying to fit millions of years into the Bible. But as we go along, we find more and more scientific evidence comes along that backs up what the Bible says, including our solar system. A few years ago, the New Horizons Project did a flyby of Pluto, and it sent back quite a bit of data that confused evolutionists who believe Pluto is four and a half billion years old. They found there is fewer impact craters on the surface than there would be after that amount of time. They found it's geologically active, something strange for an object they assumed was old, cold, and dead. They found it has a young atmosphere, should be long gone at the rate it's dissipating. And they found that the moons even orbit at different speeds and even different directions. These and many other things in our solar system defy what's known as the nebular hypothesis, hypothesis for planet formation. It's part of the Big Bang Theory. See, all those observations, they don't really fit with that idea, but they fit perfectly with biblical creation. Now, somebody could be thinking, okay, look, creation, evolution, in the end, (laughs) does it really matter what I believe? Well, I think it always matters what we believe because ideas have consequences, right? Ideas have consequences. Whatever you believe about God or about origins, your worldview, that has a profound effect on how you live your life. And the same is true for our children, our grandchildren, everybody we know. Jeff Jacobi put it this way. He said, For in a world without God, there is no obvious difference between good and evil. There is no way to prove that murder is wrong if there is no creator who decrees, Thou shalt not murder. One might reason instead, as Lenin and Stalin and Mao reasoned, That there is nothing wrong with murdering human beings by the millions if doing so advances the Marxist cause. Or one might reason from observing nature that the way of the world is for the strong to devour the weak. Or that natural selection favors the survival of the fittest by any means necessary, including the killing of the less fit. Read that last part, we might think of another major world leader from the last century and his agenda. Here's something Sir Arthur Keith said about Hitler. He said, The German Fuhrer, as I have consistently maintained, is an evolutionist. He has consciously sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. Uh, I think we know how well that turned out. So we can go back to these two histories again. We can take a look at that bottom line. And let's ask the question, well, if there is no God, then who says Right? If there's no God who made the heavens and the earth and decides what right and wrong ought to be, well then, who decides that? Well, in the absence of God, we do. We become number one. And that is an attractive prospect to anybody who doesn't want to be accountable to God. The whole idea of evolution is meant to explain how everything got here without God. Right? So you can see how that's an attractive prospect for many people. Well, 
Of course, we also live in nations, and in nations we have governments, we have to decide what the laws of the land are going to be, and for hundreds of years in the Western world, those laws have been largely based on a biblical worldview. We look to see what God had to say. But over the last hundred years, and the last 50 or 60 years especially, we've seen a gradual shift in our culture away from God's ideas to where we're kind of making up some of the rules for ourselves as a culture. Here's some of the things we get when we make up the rules for ourselves. We get things like legalized abortion. We get sexual immorality of all different kinds. It leads to things like teen pregnancies and higher rates of divorce and STDs. Nasty side effects to gaining our so-called freedom from God's ideas. We see things like eugenics. Programs intended to improve a population by eliminating the ones that some would consider less fit. Like the mentally challenged, for example. Now that's something Hitler and the Nazis are well known for, but it started in universities long before them, and it has its roots in evolutionary thought. And it hasn't gone away. And then, of course, euthanasia is in the debate. See, we've seen these things come around. and Some of these have even been on the rise in the last 50 or 60 years in the approximate time that we've been teaching evolution in public schools. Now, it's not a direct cause and effect you understand, but you can see the logic there. If we teach whole generations of young people, they're just random chance accident from the slime. There's no God who loves them, no sense of right and wrong. Well, that's going to affect their worldview over time, isn't it? And eventually, I think that'll affect the worldview of the culture as a whole, and I think we're seeing some of that in our time. It has an effect on the church as well. You may have seen some of these statistics before. There have been a lot of surveys done showing the number of young people leaving the church. The Barna Group did a study showing 61% of young people who grow up in the church leave the church by the time they're in their 20s. Then there's other studies that have been done with much higher percentages than that. Take a look at that bottom one. 90%. That's from Canada. See, we look at some of these statistics, and we've done some of our own research on this. And we start asking the question, what's going on here? Well, it's probably a few things, but another Barna study more recently gave us a clue to at least part of it. They found that 49% of church-going teens say the church seems to reject much of what science tells us about the world. Now, when they're thinking science, they're probably thinking millions of years in evolution, because that's what they've been taught as science, right? It's really a, a history. It's an interpretation. But that's what they understand as science. And of course, they've got textbooks. They've got experts. Meanwhile, in the church, we haven't necessarily always been that good at showing evidence that backs up what we believe about the Bible. And ours is not a blind faith. Right? Ours is a very reasonable faith based on actual eyewitness accounts of things that really happen. So there should be lots of evidence, and there is. We just need to show some of it. So unfortunately, when children don't get answers that they're looking for, sometimes they drift away from their faith. We've seen that happen over and over. I want to give you one last example of worldview. This one's pretty strong. Anybody here ever hear of Jeffrey Dahmer? Well-known serial killer. Um, if you haven't seen the miniseries about him, I recommend that you don't. It's pretty dark. But uh, you know what? He actually became a Christian before he died. And he gave an interview in which he said, if a person doesn't think that there's a God to be accountable to, then, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. That's how he thought when he was killing people. But then he was asked, you know, what's made the difference in, uh, in your outlook? And he explains about how his father had brought him some creation science materials. He says, so I started reading books that show how evolution is a complete lie because there is no basis in science to uphold it. And I've come to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true creator of the heavens and the earth. It didn't just happen. And I have accepted him as my Lord and Savior, and I believe that I, along with everyone else, will be accountable to him. Anybody can be saved. But you see the difference in his worldview? From the time he believed he was just a random chance accident from the slime, no God who loved him, no sense of right and wrong could do whatever he wanted, to the time he realized that there is a creator, he saw evidence for that creator, for creation. And he heard the gospel message and realized that the, his creator is also his savior. What a change. 
Now, do you imagine how different his life and the lives of others might have been if he'd understood that much sooner? Now, I'm not suggesting that anybody who believes evolution is going to become Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler. Those are extreme examples, but you can see the logic there. In fact, you can be a Christian and believe evolution. But if that's what your thinking is at, I would invite you to examine that a little more closely, in light of the science, but especially in light of the Scripture. Now, somebody might be thinking, you know, these are some big issues you're talking about here. I don't want to deal with all that. All I want to do is share the gospel with people. I want to tell people they can be saved by faith in Jesus Christ, and I would agree with that. At CMI, we understand the gospel is the number one thing. It's why we do what we're doing. Because, you see, we also understand that people have questions. Right? Before we, we can talk to people about spiritual matters, quite often they have questions of a more physical nature. You know, they might be wondering things like, well, why aren't there dinosaurs in the Bible? How did, how did Noah get all those animals on the ark? Or who did Cain marry? They might be wondering things like, what about distant starlight or, or natural selection, carbon-14? These are some of the questions that people have that act as stumbling blocks to accepting the claims of the Bible. Maybe you've heard some of them. You might be wondering some of these yourself. And the good news is that there's answers to all those questions. Biblically based and scientifically sound answers to the questions people have. Now, I'm not suggesting that if we get answers for people, they're automatically going to become believers. Certainly, they need to hear the gospel. The Holy Spirit needs to be involved. But this is a big piece of the puzzle for many people like Jeffrey Dahmer and many others who won't even consider the Bible or the gospel until they get their questions answered. Now, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So we share testimony, we share the gospel, but we're also supposed to be able to give an answer or make a defense when people question us about our faith. And they're probably going to start questioning us about Genesis. We're going to have those questions that have to do with the flood. What about the fossils? What about DNA? Distant starlight. And the reality is, you know, you're probably going to forget a lot of what I say here tonight after a few weeks. How many, for example, have already forgotten the key points of your pastor's sermon from six weeks ago? Don't raise your hand. I said that in one church, the pastor raised his hand. That's always fun. Anybody in school right now? Anybody ever been in school? We get this, right? We know if you really want to learn it and, and be able to pass the test later and be able to explain it to somebody, you can't just hear it once. You've got to have something you can go back to, some information you can look at. That's why we're in information ministry. We want to equip you with information long after I'm gone. And that's why we have all those resources. And our number one equipping tool is Creation Magazine. It's a family-oriented magazine that comes out every three months. The articles are nice and short and easy to read. It's cutting-edge science that's done within a biblical perspective. Uh, there isn't any paid advertising in it. Now, we get testimonies from people all over the world who have, seen, have read this magazine. We, we send it into over 100 countries. Here's one from a fellow named Ian. He says, about 27 years ago, I was what I considered a devout atheist. And then later he says, a Christian also handed my friend some creation magazines, which of course were then handed to me. I soon saw that the more I looked to the evidence of cre for creation and the gaping holes in the evolution story, the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle of life started to fall into place. I came to believe in the creator God of the Bible. I have been an avid subscriber to Creation Magazine since and used the evidence for creation in all my witnessing. We get those kind of testimonies from all over the world. Now it's a recurring subscription, so you sign up for it once, you arrange payments, from a credit card or bank account, it's $7.50 every three months. Not every month, it's every three months. For that, you get a hard copy of the magazine. You can have that in your home and lend it out. And you get a digital copy that you can download on up to five devices. Send the link to somebody. And if you want to sign up for the magazine tonight, I'll give you your first issue of it here for free, as well as a free DVD, a different one from the others. So I'm going to ask the ushers if you grab those clipboards a second time. And this time, as they come around, you'll see a piece of paper that looks like this, all right? 
If you want to get the magazine either for yourself or a gift subscription for somebody you know, then what you need to do is tear one of those pages off from the clipboard, just like the others. This time, though, you need to fill it out on both the front and on the back. We need name and address and email on the front for you and the person you're giving it to, if that's, if that's what's going on. Uh, we need payment information and a signature on the back. You don't pay anything here tonight. Just bring that to us out in the foyer afterwards, and we'll get you set up with your free gifts. So just a reminder, there's now two slips of paper you can potentially bring to the table a little bit later. Uh, one is for connecting with us online and a possible free DVD there if you buy something as well. And then there's the magazine and some uh, free gifts with that. But again, for all of that, you need to bring the piece of paper with you to the foyer. While those go around, I'll highlight a few other of my favorite resources. The Creation Answers book answers more than 60 of the most asked questions people have about Genesis. Things to do with dinosaurs. People think things like, you know, how did all of those animals get to Australia after the flood? All kinds of questions that people have. It's a great go-to resource to have. A good companion for that is Christianity for Skeptics. It's a little more philosophical. Uh, compares Christianity to other religions, other worldviews like atheism, Islam, Eastern religions, asks the big questions like, does God exist? Uh, those two are actually available together in what we call the Faith Building Pack, and it's at a discount. Now, if you or somebody you know is going to say, well, just show me some evidence, then Evolution's Achilles' Heels does exactly that. Nine PhD scientists looking at the evidence that evolutionists think are strengths for their arguments, fossils, DNA, geology, and shows how it's real, they're really weaknesses. They don't stand up to scrutiny. They actually support creation better than evolution. And for anybody that's in high school or heading into college or university, uh, the Creation Survival Guide helps you navigate an evolutionized school system with your faith intact and still pass the test great resource to have if you're in that situation. And then there's the Genesis account. We call this the Rolls Royce of creation books. It's almost 800 pages, and it's theological and scientific commentary on just the first 11 chapters in Genesis. It's very, very thorough, written by a PhD scientist who also understands biblical Hebrew. And coming off that, we have the Genesis Academy. It's a small group Bible study. Uh, you get 12 half-hour sessions on DVD, Go through all the major topics covered in those first 11 chapters. It comes with an online study guide. And of course, we want to equip our children from a young age. So we have a number of children's books, including a, a couple of packs that are at a discount. Uh, there's two different packs. There's one with books like this about dinosaurs and some other topics. And then there's one we call the Please Nana Pack. It's all of the Please Nana books, asking those big questions that you know, children come to, to, to Grandma with. Like, is there a God? Things like that. Now, for anybody that's really keen and really wants to soak up a bunch of this, we've got a super conference happening in Ontario this summer. So there's, we've got brochures out there if you want to learn more about that and some of the speakers we've got coming from all over the world if, if you're into this enough that you want to make that trip. And maybe you saw the big pack on the table out there. It's called the Creation Library Starter Pack. I love that a pack that's this big is called a starter pack. It just gives you an idea how much information there is. It's got all kinds of different topics that are covered. Some of the items I mentioned already, plus many more, and it's heavily discounted. It's great for a church library if you don't already have one, or a creation nut. I mean, enthusiast. Now, this last bit sounded like an infomercial, didn't it? But, you know, that's not the point. The whole point of our ministry, I, I didn't come out here to make a sale. What we want to do is we want to equip, equip you with information to bolster your own faith, but also to equip you with information to have those conversations with the skeptics that you know. And the equipping, it's, it's in the resources. But you know what? If you don't want to spend money, hey, that's fine. Get the free stuff. Get the emails. Go to the website. Who remembers the name of the website? Told you there'd be a test. All right. So we're going to take a little break right now. Did you want to say something before we do? And then we'll come back here in 15 minutes or so, and we'll do another talk all about our family tree. Yes? 
Um, if you've got a question for me, why don't you come and talk to me one on one? Because I don't think we're doing an actual public forum. Who was Cain's wife? Well, I'll tell you what. You know what? I'm actually going to deal with that in the next talk. Oh, okay. So let's... <laughs> all right. I just want to let you know that there's all kinds of pizza left over, veggie, meat, and, and works. So if you would like some pizza, it's, we went from the oven to the fridge, so now it's cold pizza. So there's juice, there's pop, there's coffee, there's tea, and pizza. And, and donuts. Donuts. Yes, and don't forget about the box in the back if you'd like to donate to the ministry.